Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 8 of the OpenStax Psychology textbook. My name is Matthew Poole and today we are going over memory. So whenever it comes to memory, overall we have three processes that we go through. You can kind of think like of memory like an information processing system similar to a computer. It has a set of processes used to, again, code, store, and retrieve information over different periods of time. Okay, so the very first step again is encoding information. So it involves the input of information into the memory system. We're also going to talk about ways in which we may fail to encode information properly and how that impacts how we remember information down the road. We have what's known as storage because we can store things into short-term memory and then eventually into long-term memory through a series of processes and procedures. And then, of course, whenever we have this long-term information, we want to be able to retrieve that information, bring out things, and put them back into awareness. Because what good is that memory if we aren't able to call upon it and retrieve it when we need to? But we're going to also look at ways that we're not as great memory machines comparatively to association machines and how we can almost hack your memory to be able to improve it through a series of um, abilities to solve that problem. So let's first start talking about encoding. So whenever the brain receives information, this is what happens. We will label slash code it, we'll organize it with other similar information, and we'll connect new concepts to existing concepts. So we have two <clears throat> types of processing, pardon me. Automatic processing it includes encoding of details like time, space, frequency, and the meaning of words. So what this means is uh, remembering when you last studied. That's uh, a lot easier to remember than maybe what you last studied, which is what's known as effortful processing. So when I last studied, well, I studied last night. And then you say, well, what did you study? Then I have to include effortful processing. It's like, well, you know, this and a little bit of that. You don't, it's hard to remember all of the details, uh, at least harder to remember all the details comparatively to automatic processing. Okay, moving forward. We have what's known as sensory memory to start things off very simply. So whenever we receive sensory information, we will store it briefly, and this is like things such as sight, sound, and taste. So it's it's just it's regarding your senses, and so it's uh, score uh, stored, excuse me, up for a couple of seconds, and then of course it's the first step of processing stimuli for, from the environment. And you can kind of think of sensory memory as like as like a filtration system. Uh, between deeming what's important versus what's not important. And if it's not important, we discard it. Now, if it is important, we will move that to short-term memory. Now, before we get to talking about short-term memory, what I want to do is demonstrate what's known as the Stroop effect. Okay, so the Stroop effect shows us how memory can fail us almost initially whenever there's an incongruence between the sensory stimuli. Okay, Now, what you're going to see demonstrated in an experience is I am going to go through each of these colors. Now, as you can see here, uh, from row one, I'm going to go from the top to the bottom, so from red to purple, and then that's row one, row two, row three. Okay, and so the name of the color is also congruent with the actual color. And what you're going to see is me struggle with the next slide because there's going to be an incongruence between the stimuli, between the word and what the color is. So this won't take me hardly any time at all to go through. And then we're going to compare that time with the other slide. So if you want to do this yourself, I encourage you to do so. It's a great exercise and a fun way to see how memory uh, can be altered or can have difficulty even from the get-go uh, whenever there's an incongruence. So without further ado, I'm going to time myself on slide one. Feel free to do it yourself if you'd like. Okay, on your mark, get set, go. Red, orange, green, yellow, purple, blue, purple, yellow, green, blue, yellow, orange, black, red, purple. So that only took me 5.19 seconds according to my phone. So remember 5.19 for me. I'm going to try and um, remember that myself. And so to compare that with the last number, or with, with that number. So again, in this slide, the colors are incongruent with the color. 
And so what I have to do is I have to say the actual color, not the word. So in that first one, you can see that it says red, but I want you to say the color, and I'm going to say the color. So I would say blue, orange, blue. Okay, so we'll go from row one, beginning with blue to red, and then row two, row three. So without further ado, let me get my phone going, okay? On your mark, get set, go. Blue, orange, blue, purple, red, orange, yellow, blue, orange, yellow, red, uh, purple, yellow, purple, orange. So that took me basically double the time. I'm now at 10.66 seconds. So because of that incongruence, it threw my sensory memory off and it was significantly more difficult to name the actual color than it was in the last slide. So that's the Stroop effect displayed. And you can do it yourself. I encourage you to do so. All right, so now that we've talked about sensory memory, let's talk about short-term memory. So short-term memory AK working memory is a temporary storage of system that can hold about seven items uh, at one time for approximately 20 seconds, give or take a couple items. Okay? And so, how we are able to take those items and put them into long term memory, uh, at least one of the ways we can do so is through rehearsal. So, if you're trying, like somebody tells you a series of words or maybe a phone number and you're trying to remember it, what do you start doing? Typically, you will start rehearsing it back over and over and over in your head to at least try and consolidate that into your long term memory. Okay? The thing, though, when it comes to long-term memory, though, is you can have uh, some storage decay with it, and if you don't use that information, sometimes, and a lot of times, you will lose it over time. But if you continue to rehearse it, continue to br uh, bring it back to um, consciousness in a way, and, and, and try and, and um, do other forms of memory consolidation such as using acronyms or initialisms that will help you remember information long term but if you're trying to a quick quick way to do so and a lot of y'all do it naturally is to just repeat that number or those series of words over and over and over again <laughs> okay until you find a piece of paper to write it down right Okay, so long-term memory can be broken up into explicit and implicit memory. So your explicit memory in long-term memory, aka known as declarative, includes your episodic memory and your semantic memory. Now when it comes to episodic, these are like your ability to remember parts of your life like episodes or like a storyline. You recall you tell your friend a cool story that happened so you go through the storyline of it. Okay, Or a semantic knowledge, you're not going through it like a storyline, it's just well, who's the president of the United States? That's just knowledge and concepts, things that you're able to bring about and remember. Okay? And so that's things that you have conscious control over, relatively speaking, comparatively to implicit memory. These are things that you are more so involuntary, don't have a lot of say so over uh, as far as consciously recalling them. Because a lot of us have specific muscle memories that we don't need to consciously remember how to do. We just get back on the horse, get back on the on the uh, bicycle, get behind the wheel, and we don't have to re-remember things like, okay, who's the president of the United States? Who's the first president of the United States? Let me think that. You know, it's pretty automatic. And so procedural memory under implicit is like your muscle memories, although the memory is not in the muscle, it's in your brain. As well as we have emotional conditioning, again, that is con can be found under classical conditioning. Remember in Chapter 6, we talked about it being an involuntary process comparatively to operant conditioning, where you learn to associate uh, two or more items together, which helps you to anticipate events. So a lot of us have a lot of associations that we didn't necessarily choose, and it helps us navigate our world. Okay, you don't have to consciously remember it. And so that's basically what I just described to you. That's just for your studying purposes if you are in my class. All right, so now that we've gone through encode as well as storage, um, and under that is short term and long term memory, we have retrieval because what's good, what good is that information if we're not able to retrieve it and bring it back into conscious awareness to be able to use it? All right, and so there are three ways that we act 
of getting information out of memory and back into conscious awareness. We have recall, recognition, and relearning. Okay. When it comes to recall, this is why we don't like uh, fill in the blank tests comparatively to multiple choice tests is because recall, you have to actually know the information without any other prompts or cues or anything to compare it to. So who is the first president of the United States? Fill in the blank. Okay. That's recall. Whenever it comes to recognition, this is what makes multiple choice tests easier and preferable for students is because you have other cues and you're able to recognize um, the, to, the answer to the question because you're seeing them reintroduced in their environment once again. And so it's like, um, it's just it's, um, a lot easier to, to do so, to, to engage in the multiple choice tests. I use multiple choice tests. I know that's a lot easier than fill in the blank, but that's the route that I go. Okay. Now, relearning. This is interesting right here. Relearning is whenever we have once learned something, and then whenever, of course, it was difficult to learn the first time, but then even if it's been some time since you've been, um, since you've been introduced to the information, um, it's a lot easier the second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever case, go around to uh, relearn that information. It comes back to you a lot quicker, okay? And there are a number, a number of examples that I'm sure you're, you've experienced this um, in. And so um, whenever it comes to our, this class, if you were to take this in person, um, what we do is we go through these slides, we go through these chapters, and then we have a unit review. And there's a method behind the madness with all this is because we I reintroduced to you a lot of the topics that we went over in uh, each unit, which is about approximately four chapters. And I'll notice that with students, the information whenever we do the unit review comes back to the students a lot quicker whenever we go over it once again. And so that best prepares them to take their exam. It, it uh, comes back to them quicker and it's retained because as we know, rehearsal is important. So a lot of times I may sound like a broken record in this class whenever I go through topics. It, it's because there's you know a purpose behind that. I want, I want you to be exposed to it multiple times uh, through a series of rehearsals so it sticks to you more. You may hate it, but and it may sound annoying at times, but that's you know, a, a way that I try and hack your memory to be able to get you to retain it a lot easier uh, than it would be otherwise just going through it one time. So parts of the brain involved in memory. There are multiple, okay? So, of course, when it comes to the prefrontal cortex, this anything involved in higher order functioning, uh, such as memory, the prefrontal cortex is going to be involved in it. It's also involved in emotional um, uh, processing uh, uh, accompanied with the amygdala to help us with uh, like classically conditioned associations, right, so with, with memory, so things that are more so unconscious. And then the amygdala uh, being involved in emotion processing, and then the hippocampus is involved in memories in general. And so do you ever wonder why it's a lot easier to remember significant events in your life comparatively than a random Tuesday? Well, there's a neuroscientific perspective that explains this, and it's because the amygdala is involved in emotion processing and, and where it's right next to the hippocampus that's involved in memories in general. When you have an event that's highly emotionally arousing or super fearful, your brain almost puts like a check mark or a footnote or a bookmark in that particular place in time or that day in general, not just the moment. And so you're able to recall that information a lot more in depth and with a lot more clarity because it had that event had a high emotional arousal attachment to it. So that's why we, we remember like a first date, our first kiss, the birth of a first child, a graduation, a breakup. There is a high level of emotional arousal associated with those events and with those days. So you remember that a lot easier. Now your cerebellum is involved in motor coordination and motor functioning. So balance, things of that nature. So again, you can think of like your muscle memory is associated with your cerebellum. It's not in the muscles. It's assisted and aided by your cerebellum to be able to coordinate movements uh, without conscious thought. 
uh, getting behind the wheel again. Um, you don't have to consciously remember, okay, I got to put it in, in park and, you know, uh, put the emergency brake on, things like that. It just happens automatically. Okay. And so this is essentially what I just described to you. You're welcome to uh, go through this um, on your own time to make it stick a little bit more out to you. All right. Moving forward. Flashbulb memories. Again, that's why uh, the amygdala and the hippocampus are right there associated or right there next to one another because it helps us with those flashbulb memories rather than just a random Tuesday. Okay, so most people, if you were born at a particular time, um, at least probably 1994, 1995, or um, or um, you know older than that, um, you can remember where you were whenever 9-11 or whenever you heard about 9-11 happening because it was such a highly atypical and unusual event with very strong emotions. Okay, so flashbulb memory. Now let's talk about some difficulties with memory. So when it comes to amnesia, this is the loss of long-term memory that occurs as a result of disease, physical trauma, or psychological trauma. And there are two types, anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia. When it comes to anterograde amnesia, this is the inability to remember new information after a point of trauma. So this is commonly caused by brain trauma, and the hippocampus is usually effective because it causes inability to transfer information from short-term memory to long-term memory. Retrograde amnesia is a loss of memory for events that occurred prior to the trauma, okay? So whenever it comes to retrograde, um, that's whenever you um, have a loss of memory for events that occurred prior to the trauma. So in the sense of you can't remember you know, things that happen after that point. Whereas anterograde amnesia, this is like your 50 first, first dates type of amnesia where um, whenever there's a trauma, you can't remember um, information after that point. You're kind of like reliving just, you know, the, either the same day like that person did in 50 first dates or just you, all you can remember is what you've learned up until the point of the event. Okay. All righty. When it comes to memory construction and reconstruction, construction is the formulation of new memories. Reconstruction is the process of bringing up old memories. This is something that is hugely impactful to our memory is suggestibility. So some people have a higher level of suggestibility than others. And so it, this is why how whenever questions are asked to us, the way that questions are formatted can influence how we answer them. And there was this study conducted in 1974 with Elizabeth Loftus. She showed that whenever you ask college students after they watch a video of two cars hitting one another, depending on just one difference in the verbiage used, there was a significant difference in the answers given. And so what she asked them was how fast were the cars going when they either smashed, collided, bumped, hit, or contacted one another. And so obviously contacted is a lot lighter and softer word than smashed. And although the cars were going the same speed uh, for every participant, the way that that word was changed up impacted the uh, answers given. And Whenever the word smash was used, it was just over 40 miles per hour that the, uh, that the uh, students average said. Um, whereas whenever it comes to contacted, they said it was approximately 32 miles per hour. So that's like almost a 10 mile per hour difference just by utilizing one word of uh, trying to, of, uh, to show suggestibility can occur uh, in individuals. So we may not think that we're impacted by, by subtleties in, in questions, but we really are. And again, more people are open to suggestibility than others, but still, it go, just goes to show. All right, whenever it comes to repressed and recovered memories, so we have what's known as false memory syndrome. This is a recall of false autobiographical memories. 
And for me, I used to call these Mandela effects, and under the off the record, I still kind of do because I still do not understand how Berenstein Bears have always been spelled like the Berenstain Bears. I always call that a, a Mandela effect, but apparently, is it was because I failed to encode the information properly, and I always just thought of it as Berenstein instead of Stain. Now, another thing that uh, your brain does, especially when you're exposed to physical or sexual trauma, is your brain, in a way to protect you, may try and repress certain aspects of a memory or the memory altogether in order to protect you. So yes, your brain does have this evolutionary adva uh, adaptation to uh, repress certain events that are traumatic or certain parts of an event that are traumatic to protect you. Okay, and this can lead to, to psychological stress in adulthood. This stress in adulthood. Okay, so going back to failing to encode information properly initially, like with my Berenstein versus Berenstain situation. Now, if you look at the um, figure below, figure. 814, you'll see a series of United States nickels. What I want you to do is take a moment and try and remember, no cheating, try and remember which is the correct depiction of the United States nickel. Okay. Do you have your answer? If you need to pause, you're welcome to do so. But if you chose C, you would be correct. Now, don't worry if you got it wrong because I think I said uh, D uh, on, on my initial attempt whenever I got this picture from Google. And so apparently the correct depiction is C of, this, uh, of all these United States nickels. And so a lot of us, we just encode enough information about our world to get by. So obviously it's a lot easier to distinguish between a nickel and a penny and a dime and a quarter just based off of size alone. Um, and maybe some subtle details that we uh, pick up on. But if we were to show, be shown uh, this, it really throws a lot of us off. Okay, let's talk about some memory errors, some more memory errors. We already talked about suggestibility and false memories. Let's talk about transience. The accessibility of memory decreases over time, such as storage decay. So quite literally, if you don't do not use information or rehearse it, you have the tendency to lose it. Also, we have what's known as absent-mindedness. We may think that we're continually paying attention to something, but sometimes, and a lot of times, our mind tends to wander off, or we look at our phone, or we look at our laptop. And because it's really hard for us to only to focus on anything more than just one item at a time, we will tend to forget aspects of what we're supposed to be listening to because of lapses in attention. So some people think that they're better at multitasking, but ultimately it's really going to distort their memory and they're not going to remember as much as they think that they're going to. Blocking is the accessibility of information is temporarily blocked, a.k.a. tip of the tongue information uh, phenomenon. I know a lot of us have experienced the tip of the tongue phenomenon. It is super annoying because it feels like it's right there on the tip of the tongue, even though it's not. Um, and is just, uh, I hate it when that happens. Let's talk about the distortion type. So misattribution, the source of the memory is confused. Bias, we always, we've we already talked about that before where memories are distorted by current belief systems and we don't really realize that we're engaging in biases until we're made known of the fact and then we can kind of correct them. We also have what's known as persistence, the inability to forget undesirable memories. You'll constantly see this with individuals who have PTSD well, they'll, where they'll have intrusive and persistent uh, memories from their traumatic event or events. Moving forward. So I know in this class, after about 20 minutes of you leaving the class, you're going to forget about 50% of what I say uh, at probably best, right? Probably worse for some people. And after 24 hours, it's about 70%. And this is whenever you learn new information. And I know this. This is why like in anatomy and physiology classes, they always tell you to go home and study this information because it's so much. And to be able to adequately retain it, 
you need to constantly rehearse it and study it. And that's, again, why in this class we tend to go over a lot of, and there's a lot of overlap in the information that we go through. It's because I want you to be able to relearn, and whenever you relearn, it comes back to you quicker and easier, and it uh, helps mitigate the storage decay that you experience as a result of learning new information. So that's why we revisit a lot of this in other chapters as well as during the unit reviews. All right, let's talk about some biases within memory. So we've got stereotypical bias, which involves ethnic and gender biases. We've got egocentric bias. This is involves enhancing our memories of the past. So for a, a good portion of people, um, and you may have a friend like this, they try and retell a story, and you were with them whenever it happened, and they just made out the story to be so much more grandiose and just fantastical than it actually was. This is, uh, you know, I caught a fish the size of this, and then it, the size of their hands continue to uh, expand, right? It's because they want people to uh, look at them in, in a way that's admirable. Or they want to make themselves look better, so they'll enhance a story or a memory of the past. And you're just like, dude, that so did not happen. Or, hey, man, it wasn't that dramatic, uh, okay? Just pump the brakes a little bit. But they want to make themselves look better. Hindsight bias, the tendency to think uh, an outcome was inevitable after the fact, thinking that you knew it along. We've already talked about this before, uh, going with the um, the stock market, saying, you know, I thought it was predictable. This, oops, I kind of lost y'all for a second there. Oopsies. Uh, thinking that the outcome was inevitable, inevitable this whole time. I knew it was coming. I'm a genius when it comes to the stock market, knowing very good and well. That I, as a novice trader and somebody who's just being introduced, there's no way that a beginner could be just so intelligent about the market. Not possible. But I thought I did initially, and then I was very, I was humbled very quickly thereafter. So again, when it comes to persistent memories, these are the memories that we call unwanted, uh, unpleasant memories, flashbacks. Because whenever individuals experience trauma, physical trauma, especially whenever it comes to military combat, and this is why I uh, respect our, our military members so much because uh, freedom is not free and the uh, difficulties that our veterans have had to go through to uh, make our country as safe and as free as it is came with a price. And uh, as a result of this, we do commonly see individuals develop PTSD from military combat. But, um, you know, I, I'm proud that we have a lot of resources. I think that they can continue to be improved upon to adequately support our vets um, because of the prevalence of PTSD. But just wanted to throw that out there and, and thank our military members for the service that they provide us. Okay, when it comes to another way that memory is impacted, let's talk about interference. So we have what's known as proactive and retroactive interference. So proactive interference is whenever we have old information hindering the recall of new information. So with this, whenever we learn a combination to our high school locker, then we um, are trying to uh, are trying to remember a, a combination to our new gym locker. We're like, oh crap, I think that my old locker combination is interfering with um, my ability to learn my new gym locker combination, even though it's been several years since you've been in high school. So proactive interference is whenever that old information hinders the recall of new information. New, now, whenever it comes to retroactive interference, this is whenever new information hinders the recall of old information. So you have... Um, your new email address and things like that and you remember that password really easily but then you get a notification that you need to log into an old email address to get some type of code or whatever the case is and then you go to sign in and you're like oh my gosh all I can remember is my new password because I've been using it constantly okay um, so moving forward with that, let's talk about ways to enhance memory. So whenever it comes to ways that like hack your memory, we have the ability, of course, to rehearse it, but we really discount mnemonic devices pretty, pretty frequently. 
And so this will include things like initialisms as well as acronyms. So initialisms include like uh, UFO, uh, whereas acronyms include PEMDAS. And whenever we associate two or more items together to be able to remember this information, it helps us so much in the long term. So if you're trying to remember something important for a test or information in general, try and attach a, a mnemonic device to it. It'll make your life so much easier. And so whenever you're in a class and you're trying to remember like a long poem, it's, a, it's really hard to just see that information and digest it all at once. So something that you may try is what's known as chunking or breaking things down into manageable chunks or bits, I should say. Uh, go sentence by sentence or a few sentences at a time or maybe a paragraph at a time. It'll be so much easier to navigate and uh, look up that mountain whenever you're just doing it a little bit at a time. But good old-fashioned rehearsal is going to be the conscious repetition of information. Try and rehearse as much as you can because it's very hard for us to hear information one time and to be able to retain it for the long term. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Okay, so lastly, the thing I want to end on is how to study effectively, all right? So whenever you're studying effectively, use elaborative rehearsal, link information to other information or memories to make it more meaningful. That's why in this class I use a lot of examples about myself because it, um, it helps me to remember it and thereby maybe it helps you to relate to it and so you can remember, remember it by your ability to relate to it. Uh, so again, another method behind the madness. Apply the self-reference effect. Make it personally information to you. Make the information personal, personally meaningful to you. This is like for me, again, going off the same information. I make it uh, meaningful to my experiences in particular. Try and apply these psychological concepts to things that I have experience in particular don't forget the forgetting curve keep studying keep rehearsing all right just you got to keep going at it to prevent that storage decay because if you don't use it you will lose it over time be aware of interference minimize distractions if because again we were studying and then we look at our phones we uh, look at our laptop something piece of information that can really hinder uh, and be an interference to our ability to retain information keep moving um, people will discount exercise quite frequently but you need to uh, get up and be about uh, the world and, and engaging in it because that will help your brain in um, in particular the hippocampus of the growth of new brain cells there's a method behind the madness when it comes to exercise so engage in it get enough sleep this is hugely important some people think that staying up super late is adequate for studying but I always tell people study but then get your sleep and then try and wake up early. Don't try and pull an all-nighter and then go in because your brain is not going to be as sharp cognitively as if you were to be to get adequate sleep and then wake up at an earlier time to study before the test. Okay. And lastly, as we just mentioned and talked about, use those mnemonic devices. Pair those uh, that important those important uh, pieces of information or parts of the body if you're in anatomy and physiology class to an acronym so you can easily remember it to pair two or more items together to learn from association because we are great association machines and unfortunately not as great memory machines and we have to do a lot of things to be able to hack our memory to be able to retain information. So that is going to end chapter eight. I appreciate y'all uh, tuning into this one, and we will. I will see you in the next video for chapter nine, lifespan development. Have a great day.